Get it. And if you have your Bible, turn with me to Acts chapter 15. Acts chapter 15, as we'll continue along with the really the, the resolution of a problem that happened there in, in the area of Antioch, as we handed out a map to you guys last week, they kind of showed you the area where Paul was traveling in the first missionary trip. And of course, where it was at, as you remember, is up in the area of the present day of the country Turkey, which is really where they were. And, uh, and what had happened is as they would get up and share the gospel, the freedom and the grace of God with the Gentiles, there were those who were coming out of Jerusalem that really wanted them to go back underneath the law. That's terrible when people want to put, bring you underneath their thumb and, you know, where they want to come underneath your control. And, and not only is that, it's... Uh, uh, you know, it's something in society that's been happening forever where men want to control other men. I was just re, uh, watching a video series by a guy named Francis Schaeffer, and it was on How, how Then Should We Live series. is a great series. And it talked about the, how throughout society, men have tried to control other men. And that didn't change, and certainly hadn't changed when it came to the church. And so Paul and Barnabas got wind of this, and they said, you know what, let's take care of this right away. Because we've been ministering, and I love it, as they were led of the Holy Spirit, let's don't let this problem fester. Let's go bring it to light, and let's take care of it. So they went down to Jerusalem, as we saw last week, and, and a council got together, those brothers who've been walking with the Lord a little longer, you know. Uh, James was there, and, and some of them, you know, Peter. And Peter got up last week, and he gave his defense of, of what he had experienced there as he was out there ministering to the Gentiles. Gentiles, how the Holy Spirit came upon them and how they received Jesus Christ, just like we do even to this day. And so in verse 12, where we pick up the story here this morning, it says, Then all the multitudes kept silent and listened to Barnabas and Paul, declaring how many miracles and wonders that God had worked through them among the Gentiles. So as they're disputing still, or always presenting their case is probably a better way to look at it, they gave Paul and Barnabas an opportunity to share, to tell their story. I wish we had the full account. Wouldn't it have been marvelous to hear their, through their eyes all the great things that God had done through them. But it tells us in verse 13, he says, after they, had, after they had become silent, we don't know if they talked for five hours, ten days, or what. You know, they had a period of time where Paul and Barnabas were sharing what was going on. James answered saying, men and brethren, listen to me. And this is certainly the same James that we're studying on Thursday night, the book of James. Uh, we know James as being the, the half-brother of Jesus. And I love this about James, as, as we mentioned on a Thursday night when we started the book of, of James, how James called himself a bondservant of the Lord. He isn't coming there thinking that, hey, I'm James, the brother of Jesus. You guys had better listen to me. You know, sometimes people want to roll in and say, hey, I have a lot of clout. I'm a, I'm a big boy, and you better listen to me. And, but rather, James, everything that we see about him, he was really a godly servant and a humble man. Any great man or woman that you'll see that has a true encounter with God is somebody who's void of self-interest, is somebody that's concerned about pleasing God and to do the things that are right before the Lord. And it tells us, and Simon has declared, as he tells us in verse 14, I think it's interesting, he doesn't call him Peter here. He probably knew him from earlier in his life as Simon. He says, Simon has declared how God at the first visited the Gentiles to take out them uh, people for his name. And with the words of the prophets agreed, just as it's written. What's he saying here is the work of God is calling the Gentiles to be part of his kingdom. James is using the Old Testament to demonstrate what God is doing in the Old Testament, I mean, in the New Testament. In Psalm 86, verse 9, it says, All nations whom you have made shall come and worship you, O Lord. 
In Isaiah 11, 10, he says, And in that day there shall be a root of Jesse, who should stand as a banner to the people, for the Gentiles shall seek him, and he rested, uh, rested place shall be glorious. And Isaiah 42, 6, And I, the Lord, have called you righteous, and will hold your hand, and I will keep you and give you a covenant to a people as a light to the Gentiles. And we could go on and on and on and show in the Old Testament how God's eyes were always towards the Gentiles. God, For God so loved the world and gave his only begotten son. This is just a New Testament concept. It's, it, it's embedded in the Old Testament where God loves everybody. And, and here we see James bringing it to, the te- to attention to everybody here. He say, hey, remember, this is something that was spoken in the Old Testament. Verse 16, he says, and after this, I will return and rebuild the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down, and I will rebuild its ruins, and I will set it up. God had promised to David that there should never cease to be one of the seeds sitting upon the throne of David. David's interpretation of the promise of God to mean that the Messiah would come to be a descendant of David. And here James quotes from Amos chapter 9 verse 11 is what James is quoting from. This prophecy was fulfilled in Jesus that he will come and declare, uh, set up the God, godless kingdom. And G- James is declaring that this is what's happening. God has not yet what done, as he said. God's not done with the nation of Israel. I believe that. I believe that even what we're seeing in prophecy coming to light today is amazing. It, do you guys ever amazed at how much Israel's in the news? How much is going on? I've been there. A lot of us have been there. It's not a very big country at all. Very small country. But yet God's eyes are upon that nation. And we're going to see, once again, I will uh, rebuild its ruin and I will set it up. I believe this is direct prophecy back in 1948 when we once again started seeing the, the gathering of the nation of Israel. Israel at this time, prior to 1948, if you would go up to Galilee, you wouldn't want to go there. It was a cesspool. Mosquitoes were every place. Nobody wanted to be there. It's been in ruins forever. But now you go there. Oh, my goodness. They, they like to call Israel the bread basket of the world because up there in the Hula Valley is kind of like our San Joaquin Valley here in California. They're able to grow crops after crops after crops and, and, and they really supply a lot of the fruits and vegetables that feeds Europe comes right out of that one that place as we see right here where James is saying, I will rebuild its ruin and I will set it back up. That's happening right before our eyes. In verse 17, so that the rest of mankind may, may, my, mankind may seek the Lord. Even, notice, even all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord, who does all these things. James is looking at the place of the Gentiles in the overall plan of God, but declaring that his plan doesn't, doesn't take away the fact that the Messiah, Jesus Christ, is going to return to establish his kingdom, the kingdom of David that he is talking about. Verse 18, known to God from eternity are all his works. God said through the prophet Isaiah in Isaiah 46, verse 9, for I am God and there's no others. I am God. There's no others like me declaring the end from the beginning from the ancient times things that are not yet done done. Isaiah chapter 46. One of the great differences between the God of the Bible and all the other gods in the world is Bible prophecy. Bible prophecy is, is, uh, is certainly one of the strongest proofs that we have that the Bible is the word of God. And James here is talking about how this will come to pass God has shown and declared in scriptures long before things has ever happened. 
And he's in Isaiah chapter 42, verse 9, he says, Behold, the former things have come to pass, and the new things I declare, for they spring forth, uh, uh, I tell you of them. And so as he's, James here is talking about how the Gentiles are going to be part of the family of God. They're going to be part of what we're doing. He says, he said, then he goes on, he says, but that doesn't discredit what God's doing with the Jews. There's going to be a work that's going to continue on with the nation of Israel because the Bible tells us it's in prophecy that once again, the eyes of the Lord are going to go back onto the nation of Israel. In verse 19, therefore, he says, therefore, when you consider these things, what the scriptures had to say, you consider the, the, uh, the testimony of Peter, you consider the testimony of Barnabas and, and Paul. He says, therefore, I judge that we, that we should not trouble those from among the Gentiles who are turning to God. Simple advice, isn't it? That we don't trouble these people. Unfortunately, there's always troublemakers in the church. They have different motivations. They have different reasons for doing things. They don't serve a God out of a pure heart. Right now, there's new troublemakers that are brewing in Southern California and around California. There's one up in the San Bernardino. I forget the name of the movement. It was right there a minute ago, but it slipped out of my brain. But... <laughs> But they're out there. They're, they're, they're bringing back again. They're getting a big following, the name it and claim it guys, and the Pentecostals hyperness that you've seen, not even all the way back for what happened in, uh, um, up in the Toronto Blessings and everything else that they had years ago. It seems like, I remember Pastor Chuck used to tell me, he says, you know, there's nothing new about that stuff. I go, what do you mean? He says, we've been following this forever. It's easy, like it goes away for a while and then the enemy brings it back again and you get a new wave. Everybody gets excited about these things and they start following these things. Uh, Kay and I were talking earlier, he says, the reason why people end up following these different you know, I want to call it the cultage type stuff because it distracts people from Jesus Christ is the number one reason is your old man doesn't have to die in those movements. Jesus said, if you want to follow me, what? You first of all got to die, deny yourself, die to yourself, pick up your cross and follow me. And, we, and, uh, and James is saying, don't bother, don't bother those Gentile believers. They know the grace of God. Why are you going to try to, as Paul tells us, why are we going to try to put the yoke of bondage back on, on them? It, it, a good book to read alongside these portions of scriptures, of course, is the book of Galatians, where Paul speaks directly to, to this group of people known as the Judaizers. We're trying to bring them onto the, this place of bondage. Paul wrote later on concerning these Gentiles in Antioch, and in Ephesians chapter 2, a verse that we love so much, he says, for by grace that you save through faith, not of yourself, it is a gift of God, not of what? of works, lest any man should boast. So the works that they were doing, of course, was, you know, they were wanting to come to them and says, you can't be saved unless you go through circumcision, unless you go back to the different ways of which the Jews thought they had to do their ceremonial cleansing, their ceremonial everything in order to be righteous before God. And Paul later on, he says, no, you don't have to do that. Because by grace, you are saved. We don't have a bunch of hoops we have to jump through. Aren't we so thankful for that? We just come to Jesus just as we are, and he loves us. You know, it was just one sentence that James said in our verse here, verse 19, we should not trouble them. Good advice. In verse 20, it says, but that we write that they abstain from things that polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, and from things strangled with blood, um, from blood. Of course, to keep them from, you know, polluting for, by idols, uh, up there they had all their idols that they used to worship, and they had their really the temple and the temple priests, their priestess, and, and they had all these really sexual type of performance that they had within their temple and they would do their 
sacrifice is right in there. And so Paul is saying, he says, you know what? Clean your act up. Prior to Christianity, sexual immorality was common and accepted. The way they treated women, the value of women, was poor, to say the least. The Bible raises the place of a woman, which rightfully should be, and a place of honor and a place that we should love as you read the writings of Paul. And here James is saying, he says, there's only a couple things. I'm going to lay a lot of heavy burdens on you. He says, stay away from the things that are polluted by the idols, the things that they've been using to worship with, so you don't get drawn back into it. That you don't, you know, get sucked into the fascination. And believe me, all these, this temple, who was behind it, this temple worship was who? Was Satan. And he knows how to appeal to the flesh of man and the things of man. And he say, stay away from it. I was uh, telling Mesa that the other day I was on a, how Satan works. I was on one of my Bible sites that I go to. A good, solid Bible site. It wasn't a blue-letter Bible. It was somebody, somebody else. And right on to my left, they, they send you pop-up ads, right? And right on my left came a pop-up ad of some, some girl things. I go, wait a second. I'm on a Bible site. I'm exactly where I'm supposed to be. Satan is so wise. He'll take every means that he can to attack us. And, and so out with that Bible site, right? And so that's what James is saying. He says, us men and women, and I speak to the men here, to stay away from the, the things that will pollute, that are polluted by idols for sexual immorality. And I'm glad he said that. Because God has set up a standard by which we should live our lives, not only as a man, as a woman. And, and sex belongs between a husband and wife. It's beautiful, it's holy, it's right. He says it's immoral, things that are wrong. And then he says things that, str that are strangled from blood. Of course, during that time, he, he, he was talking about, you know, you know keeping the blood it's still in the body and some way or another they like eating the blood. And, and of course, the, the life of the flesh is in the blood and one of the most unwholesome things that uh, uh, certainly a Jew could think about was the blood. But the suggestion was not for righteousness sake. Well, let's make sure we understand that. Some people will say, well, I won't do this because of righteousness sake. And it's not kosher. You know, and they almost come with this idea that they're doing something to make them righteous. Paul speaks on this in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 25. As he writes to the Gentiles' church on the same issue, issue he says, Eat whatever is sold, sold in the meat market, asking no questions for conscience' sake. For the earth is the Lord and its fullness. If any of those things we, who do not believe invite you to dinner, they, you know, he's given this a situation, that they invite you over for, for dinner, and you desire to go, eat whatever is set before you, asking no question for conscience' sake. Let's say they give you a stew. And it has some carrots in the stew. It has some corn, you know, you know, potatoes in there. And you see that there's meat inside of it. He says, don't ask where that meat came from. But if anyone says to you, this was offered to idols, do not eat it for the sake of the one who told you. And for conscience sake, for why is my liberty judged by another man's conscience? Wow, that's pretty powerful, isn't it, what he said there? But if I partake with thanks, why am I evil spoken of my food, which I give thanks? Therefore, whatever you eat or drink or whatever you do, do what? All to the glory of God. He says we have this great freedom in Christ. James has given him some advice. He says, you know, you know, don't bother him. Stay away from these things. Don't get involved with it. And then he tells us in verse 21, for Moses had throughout many generations those who preached him in every city being read in the synagogues every Sabbath. Though the Jews in the, in the church had converted to Christianity, their minds, they, they couldn't erase everything. They've been taught since they were kids that the synagogue every Sabbath of their lives, they were still bound by the ceremonial law. 
We see this even today in a lot of Messianic fellowship where they try to keep the, the Jewish tradition. They'll try to keep kosher per se and, and they keep the rabbinical law and lighting a, the candles on the Sabbath day. They, they believe they just place themselves under, within the law that they're special people. You know, God bless them. They are special because Jesus loves them and that Jesus died for them also. We're all one in Christ, what, what James is trying to remind us here in verse 22. Then it pleased the apostles and the elders with the whole, the whole church to send chosen men and their company to Antioch and, and Paul and Barnabas, namely, and Judas, whose also name was Barsabbas, and Silas, leading men among the brethren. So wisely, these guys were, were sending somebody else to go along with James and Barnabas. Because when they got up there, they couldn't say, well, James and Barnabas forged this letter, or they did something wrong with it. They sent these other dear brothers with them to go on up there and to share the word of God with them. When divisions come within the church, where people have disagreements, I think it's so important as we see here is that we gather together to pray. We ask for the mind of the Spirit. That means we humble ourselves. Say, rather my opinion, I think this is right. We wait for God and we ask for the mind of the Spirit. As he was, we're seeing how the Spirit is directing all this. The Holy Spirit's actively involved with the early church. The Holy Spirit should be actively involved with our church today and with the Agape Chapel, leading and guiding us each and every day. I pray that you guys see that within your own lives, how the Lord, you're responding to the prompting of the Spirit. Paul ultimately said in Romans chapter 14, verse 17, the kingdom of God isn't eating and drinking. That, that's, that's not the real kingdom of God, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. And so as they're going forward with his other brothers to take the letter from James and the council back up to them, in verse 23, it tells us what they wrote. They wrote this, them, this letter by them, the apostles, the elders, and the brethren, to the brethren who are the Gentiles in Antioch, Syria, Cilicia, greetings. Notice the fruit, the fruit, really the proof that the walls are being broken down from Jerusalem all the way up to to Turkey, do you see that in amazing words, what they said to the, to the fellowship up there? He said, brethren. He's calling the Gentiles believers brothers. Not like, okay, you guys Gentiles, you're second class citizens. No way. The gospel tears down walls. The gospel tears down divisions between each other because we're all in the same boat. We're born sinners. And we needed a savior. And Jesus Christ, the shed blood of Jesus, uh, of Jesus, set us all free. And then in verse 24, since we have heard that some who went out from us have troubled you with, uh, with words, out of settling your soul, saying you must be circumcised to keep the law to whom we gave no such commandments. Otherwise, these guys were not sent from us. They misrepresent who we are. And there's people who go out to misrepresent the gospel of Jesus Christ. They're not sent from us because it is the grace of God. They, they, they tried to sought to subvert them and they did not represent the brothers in Jerusalem. In verse 25, and it seemed good to us being assembled with one accord to send chosen men to you with our beloved brothers, Barnabas and Paul, men who have risked their lives for the names of our Lord, our Lord Jesus Christ. And, and here James is saying, he says, these guys almost died. They could have died as out there missionary. These are the real McCoys. And they're really kind of given to the people up there in the area of Turkey, say, Paul and Barnabas are good guys. And we have therefore sent Judas and Silas who, who will also report the same thing by the, by the word of our mouth. Otherwise, they're going to confirm these things. For it seemed, verse 28, it seemed good to the Holy Spirit 
and to us to lay hand lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things. It really does tell us how they recognize the place of the Holy Spirit in their decision maker making. It seemed good to the Holy Spirit. Acknowledging the Holy Spirit as God is part of the triunity of who we worship. When we say God, that I hope all of us understand it's God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, not God the, Holy, the itty bitty Holy Spirit. He's as much as God as God the Father, God the Son is. And He's actively involved with the church here as, he's, as they recognize, first of all, the importance of the Holy Spirit and leading their decision. And then it says, secondly, it seemed good to us. Do you see that? Their knowledge of the wisdom of the Lord, it seemed good to us, even though at times we might have a difference of our opinion in our mind. When the Holy Spirit speaks the truth, it's like everybody goes, oh, that's right. Is there's a calmness about it. In Thursday night, this coming night, I'll give you a little sneak peek of Thursday night's message. We're to be talking about there, James 1. He says, if any man lacks wisdom, what are we supposed to do? We're supposed to ask God, and God's going to do it. He's going to give it to us liberally to everybody who asks. And that council was asking for the leading of God, for the wisdom of God. And so then you might ask me, he says, how do you know if it's God's wisdom or just me? You ever been there? Well, James tells us later on, how do we determine? He says, for the wisdom for above is what? First, pure, peaceful. And then it's easy to entreat. Otherwise, it makes sense. It, it just kind of, and I think at that point, the, the council, when they got this word, they get, heard James say these things, everybody says, yeah, that makes sense. Does that make sense to you, John? Ray, does that make sense? And you just go around and you go, yeah, that's the Lord. And so they saw that and they recognized it. And then he goes and repeats there in verse 29 that you would abstain from things offered the idols, from blood, from things strangled, from sexual immorality, and to keep yourself from these, uh, you will do well. And farewell. He doesn't go on and put on a whole bunch of yoke of bondage and a big list of regulations. And when they were sent off, they came to Antioch. And when they had gathered the multitude together they'd, and delivered the letter, and when they read it, they rejoiced over its encouragement. The Holy Spirit, when the Lord is working, it brings joy. It brings, you know, that, that sense that God's in control. In Isaiah 49, verse 13, we'll finish with this and we'll pick it up next week, the rest of 15. It says, but God loves to comfort his people. And Isaiah wrote, sing, O heaven, be joyful, O earth, and break out and sing in O mountains, for the Lord has comforted his people and will have mercy on his afflicted. If you were there at the church there in Antioch, when Paul of Barnabas was down there in Jerusalem, and having these people there in your fellowship that were trying to tell you, says, you're not really saved unless you do this and this and this. I can imagine it was troubling in their church. And when Paul and Silas returned with these men and they read this letter to them, I could picture that fellowship say, praise the Lord. And there was great rejoicing because God knew what they needed. God knew that that fellowship was hurting. That God knew that they were confused. And the Lord brought comfort to them. And the net result, the hearts of the people will rejoice. And this day, I think that's what God would have us to do, is rejoice in the grace that God would have us to walk in day in and day out. Why don't we pray and then Corey and Ray will come up and close this in a song. Father. to lay aside his
climbing on.